Hello everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about um, creating a wireframe in Dreamweaver. So you will need to learn the basics of CSS versus HTML um, and how the normal typical stacking order works within HTML. Um, those are the big terms for today. I have a little term sheet that I'll show you in a moment. Um, but first, let's go to the wireframe in Photoshop because really that's where we start all our web design is with our Photoshop um, mock-up, which I haven't done yet, but what I do have is I have my original drawing um, of what I want my interface to basically, how, how I want my interface to be organized. And on top of that, I've laid some boxes where my content will go. So let's dial back the opacity just a hair here. So um, everything in red is stuff that will stay on the screen on every page. So my header will always be there, so it's in red. Because um, I want people to know that you're going to be baking sourdough pretzels and not them not forget that. Um, this step will be, you know, what step they're currently on. So, you know, it might be bake or fold or, um, or mix or whatever. And I want that listed here. Although I have thought I might move that to the bottom as like a footer. These steps, um, the process of making sourdough pretzels. You know, when I click on these, it will change my main content right here. So that is dynamic, it'll change. And the description will change based on the step. And on the right side, I will probably have a list of things that you will need, like mixing bowl or whatever, that you can click on. And it'll take you to an external link on like Amazon or um, so that you can buy those things. Um, also, I, you know, I've thought instead of that, I might do a history kind of thing, like the history of yeast or the history of sourdough, or the history of pretzels, or all those things together. But you do have some external links that you need to include, and you should try to provide some sort of um, content value added idea with that. You know, it should reflect what you're trying to talk about and enrich that um, instructable. Okay, um, so that's where we're at. Just to turn on my type layer a second. Um, again, the green things will change. The red stuff will be on every page. Um, but this is what I would start with is, you know, have your sketch and figure out how things are going to be laid out before you open up Dreamweaver. Okay, while we're here, um, the things we're going to look at today in terms of terms, stacking order, well, HTML versus CSS first. What are the differences? Um, you need both of them to create a website anymore. Stacking order um, is a concept we'll talk about today, and some basics about CSS selectors, because the word selector is going to come up a lot, class selector and ID selector. Okay, so you can pause this and read this over. That's what I would recommend at this point. All right, Dreamweaver. I'm going to launch Dreamweaver, um, but before I do, let's go to my desktop again. Um, minimize this guy. Go to my desktop. And command shift new to make a note, new folder down in the corner there. Um, we'll call it sourdough project one. And you can use hyphens. Should all be, oops, I messed up. That should be lowercase. All lowercase, no spaces because it's basically any folder or file should follow naming conventions for the web. Um, lowercase and no spaces. Folders don't need an extension. They're the one exception. They don't, they're not .html or .folder or anything. There's no .folder. Okay, so <laughs> this is our other local root folder. So now we will have two. You can, you know, this is an assignment to do the wireframe, but if you're handling it correctly, you're making a wireframe for your project so that you're killing two birds with one stone. Um, you know, and not spinning your wheels. So I'm just going to go ahead and put my sourdough project start folder. Start on, start on that now. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dreamweaver. Here we go. Launching Dreamweaver 2020. Now, by default, it'll go to my previous project. So that was my um, little intro that I showed you all, where we did my first web page. You know, and it, right now we're in split view just because that's where I left it. But remember, there's a code view and a split view and a live view. Well, we want our new local root folder. Remember, always start here with files and check where you're at. Um, 
So how do we do a new local new local root folder, a new site folder? We go to site, new site. We give it a name. Here we can use caps if we want. Called sourdough sites. And I mean, I could use the same terminology I used for my local root folder. That would probably be good too, but as long as I know what it is. All right, we need a file in there. Now notice, first of all, I have my new site, but I have my old file. So I would say X all these things out, or you're gonna get confused because we're gonna have a new index for this site. And that one is also called index, because remember the first page, like your home page, the file type, the file name should be index.html. All right, but we, so we need an index HTML, so we can come over here. Remember, you're probably gonna to wanna to go file new, but I would recommend going right here to this little dropdown, and if it, unless it's buggy, because Dreamweaver can be a little buggy, it should give you an option to do new file, as long as you're clicked on something in here, and call it index. All right, if it doesn't do that, you can go file new, and there's HTML, and the beauty of this, actually, it lets you do starter templates and things like that, although that's not great for now because I want you guys to understand what's going on. Um, but if I did it here, I would need to make sure that right after I start my new file, I save it. Before I do anything, save it right into your local root folder. The beauty of doing it here with this little hamburger is that I, you notice I didn't have to save this file, but if I go to my local root folder, it's in there already. It by default puts it right in my local root folder if I do it from the little hamburger in the files browser. Okay, so let's double click on this and put this in split view again. You'll see it had to create some HTML tags. Remember, all the tags are paired. So my body tags, there's a begin body on line eight and an end body on line nine. The HTML tag begins on line two and ends on line 10. You know, it's basically making a sandwich. And for today, everything in our body sandwich is what we're going to be working on. <laughs> um, so well, let's go ahead and add my header box. So I'm not putting the header in yet, but the graphic for my header is going to go into that box once it's ready. <laughs> I haven't done it yet, obviously. Um, but I have my wireframe, and that's the first step. So I can make up my wireframe before I've even started to create my layout in Photoshop. You know, I have my basic layout, but until I start to create the real graphics, um, I need a header. So how do I go to a header? Well, here's where, remember, you should have your files, your insert, and CSS designer tabs open. Anything else down here, you should close all those tabs like we did before. That DOM panel should go away because you're going to need this whole row. You know, at home, I have um, two monitors, super helpful. I keep all um, my editing stuff on one monitor and all my palettes and windows on another, it's very handy. Okay, so files is where we were. We're in, we, we double check or triple check that we're in the left, the right, correct, local root folder we are in my sourdough project. Go to my insert menu. I'm gonna insert a header down here. First of all, notice I'm on HTML. There's all kinds of things I can insert, but HTML is the default. Um, the next and most important thing is I want to make sure my cursor is on line nine, the line right after my body, whatever line that might be. It might not be line nine for you, but you see your body. If there's no space, hit return. You can have extra lines in there. It's no biggie. And it doesn't really matter where your cursor is bouncing in there, just so long as it's between these two tags. All right. Um, and then I'll just say header. I click that icon once and it comes up with this header. Now here's where that little reference sheet um, is handy. It describes what a class is and what an ID is. In this case, I'm only gonna have one header, so it's gonna be a unique object. And if I wanna be able to, to have links within a single page called anchor links, I need things to be ID'd so that I can link directly to those unique IDs. So an ID selector is something, these are, I'm gonna make a selector, but an ID selector is one in which there's only a single occurrence of that thing, right? It's unique. So don't call it header because that's what the HTML is gonna call it. So don't use the same term that's in here because that's what basically what the HTML will list it at. Make something unique. So I might call it my header or um, pretzel header. 
Pretzel is a long word. I'd probably abbreviate that. Um, and ultimately, I'll probably spell it wrong. <laughs> okay. And then I click New CSS Rule. We're going to make our first CSS rule. All right. So we're inserting a header, which is an HTML element. But I need to make a rule to talk about what it's going to look like. And we'll talk about that more in a second. What happens next is Pretzel header comes up, auto-populating this column here. And it puts a little hashtag in front of it which you need to keep because that symbolizes an ID selector. So it says ID selector because that's what I asked it to be. And so that should, you can confirm it here. It has a hashtag because it's an ID selector. And then down here, I want to say, I want a new style sheet. Um, so we're going to make an external style sheet. It will be a separate file where all my CSS will um, be deposited. So I'll say, okay. And only this time will it ask me for the name of my style sheet. Um, sourdough project.css. It will have to have a .css extension. Don't leave any spaces. Um, you can have a hyphen again. Use all lowercase. Put it in your local root folder. My sourdough project one is my local root folder. And I'll say save. The next screen that comes up, it says it's going to define my rule, CSS rule definition for pretzel header, which is my ID selector. So I've made a selector, and now I need to tell it, I have to give it certain properties and certain values. So for everything, when you start, please remember this. Give it everything a background color so that you can see it. Otherwise, the default background color is nothing. So you can see an empty box on a white screen, which you won't see because you won't know where it actually is. So in sticking with my um, Photoshop layout, I'll put all the um, persistent things red and all the changeable things some version green. All right, so there's a red background. And I, then another important thing is I need to give it a size. And here, here is where, um, here is where you need to just guess, sort of, because you don't know what your audience um, your user is going to be using in terms of what kind of computer. They might have a laptop, they might have um, a desktop. Um, later on in the semester, we're going to talk about how you can um, how you can design for different screens, and you can create a site that will automatically um, change for whatever they're using. But this is complicated in the sense that we're going to have to write different rules for every device. So we don't want to do that just yet. We're going to have to just kind of take a um, presume for this first project you're working for a desktop screen and maybe not even a super good one because my laptop might have one resolution, but my monitor might have a different, they do have a different resolution. Like, like for example, all the lab monitors in Macy and Rowe, um, they're all IMAX. They all have a 1920 by 1080 HD resolution. So that's 1920 pixels wide and 1080 tall. Um, that doesn't mean you should design for that because there's also browser Chrome and your user can take their browser and make that window any size they want. They don't need to do a full screen browser. So lots of options. So what we're going to do today right here is we're just going to pick like 1100 and later I'll show you how to use percentages so we can at least make that fit the width of our site. But for now, 1100 pixels, everything's in pixels. Um, and a height of, let's say, 700. You know, everything is more long than height. So also when you're designing, think about that. Um, for now, these things, padding and margin, we're going to set to zero. And then I'll show you what those actually do. And I'll say OK. And then I'll say OK. And oops, that my box is too big because I wasn't paying attention to my own self. <laughs> and that's OK. That's good that it actually is too tall because I'm going to show you how we actually fix that. That's where, so now we can go to our CSS designer because we made a rule and you can see up here there's a separate file, which I'm going to save right now. This is our CSS file and there's the first rule we made. There's our selector, pretzel header, there's a curly brace to start off all our different declarations. We have five declarations. A declaration, declaration consists of a property, here the properties, background, color, and a value. There is color. 
That's the color code that's called a hex code. It's um, six digits with uh, a hashtag at the beginning that defines colors for the web. You could also write in the word red if you wanted, and that would actually work for HTML. Um, there's a whole list of colors that you can just type in the color, and we'll use that later this semester, but the Dreamweaver by default will put in um, the hex code. Okay, um, going back to fix this pretzel header and the width, I could, you can see the height is right there, 700 pixels. I could literally type the number, change the number here to like 100, and now it's 100 pixels tall. Or I could come over here to my CSS designer. If it's grayed out, depending on what window in, it might be grayed out. Just click around somewhere until it's not grayed out. Um, and then I need to go through from the top down and say, okay, I want to work on my Sourdough project.css. Um, I'm going to use my pretzel header selector. And remember here I'm in all, so you can see all my selectors right now. There's only one, so it won't make a bit of difference. Where this number 100 is, I could change it here too. Maybe I wanted 150 pixels. Make sure you add the units. Notice it changes over here too. Okay, also I need to go back to my source code before I do anything else. This is my CSS. So what's the difference between HTML and CSS? Well, in this case, and in most cases, the HTML, like line 10 in this case, puts my header on the page. Um, but if I didn't have the rule for it, I might not even see it. The header would be there, and I could put stuff in it, but I might not even see it. So the CSS gave it a red background, and a specific size. Okay, so those that's what the, the two work in tandem. You could compare the HTML like to a, a person's body. They have a head, they have a torso, they have legs, and they have feet. It's pretty uniform. Um, and then the CSS might be where, okay, they're wearing a blue shirt today, they're wearing a pair of shorts, they're wearing Nike shoes. You know, it would describe exactly more in detail what they look like. So that would be the CSS. All right, but they work together um, to form your website. Okay, designers need CSS <laughs> or they couldn't make things look good at all. Um, all right, let's add something else to this page. If we look at my Photoshop documents, um, right here, the next thing I have is a subheader. It will change based on my content. So. Um, we don't really need to worry about that now, what changes or not. I'm just doing that to help you in the future in terms of guiding you. Um, so we'll make a green box. That'll be the subheader. So here's where I need to pay particular attention to my stacking order. So I need to go to my next line. So if I want a box under box, I need to have that sort of look um, in my HTML. It needs to have the thing that comes at the top of the page first and the thing that comes second, next, and the th thing that comes third, you know, in in order down the page. So this will be my subheader. I can go to my insert menu again, just so long as my cursor is blinking on the next line. You know, everything will be showing up within the body. If you are not paying attention and you have the cursor blinking up here or something and you go to your insert menu and you insert something, it's gonna mess things up entirely. So I can't tell you how critical it is to make sure you're paying attention to your code window down here and your cursor is in the right spot when you go to your insert menu. Okay, so we already inserted a header. And then the question is, what do we put in next? Well, um, sort of the catch-all thing for anything that doesn't fit a specific thing, there's no thing for a subheader. I could just call it a section. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, it's not really a footer because those are on the bottom of the page. Um, we'll use this aside thing. The main one's saved for my main content, but I could use that too. It's really just so that when you look at your your code over here, you can tell like, oh, there's my header, it's probably that red thing at the top of the page, because that's where headers go. Um, but I could have put, use this header thing and place it really anywhere on the page. It's really, again, just so you can go through your code and you can figure out what tag is what thing up here fairly easily. Okay, so next, go back to line 11. I'm gonna do a section. So if you, I missed my, there we go. So this section, <coughs> um, I could give this a class or ID. I, you know, I know a bunch of designers that only use classes <laughs> until they really, really need to use an ID because they need a link to something. Um, so, I mean, if you don't understand the difference between these two yet, you probably, you know, I, I've told you, well, 
this is for multiple things and this is for unique things and you'd be like, well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. You're not gonna break it. Nothing's gonna go wrong. You can use these interchangeably up to a point. Um, so just for funds, we'll just go ahead and make this a class just to show you the difference. Um, so we'll call this my subheader. Um, uh, this is where, well, I'll just call it, since I've been using that, subheader um, section. You can camel case things. So I used a capital S here for camel case. And then I'm going to click new CSS rule again. And notice in this case, it put a little period in front of it because it's a class selector. And that's just what CSS does. In CSS, a class header is indicated by a period. So don't take that out. If this does not auto-populate, then you'll have to type in dot subheader section. It's spelled exactly the same way. It is case sensitive, so if you camel case it before, you have to camel case it now. But hopefully your Dreamweaver will, will auto-populate this. Um, the other important thing we want to do, and notice it does say class up here, because that's what I asked for, is now it's down here, we have our sourdough pro project.css thing already specified. So we can pick that. Make sure you pick that. So make sure you look here to confirm it's a class, that it has a period here if it is a class, that it's the sourdough or whatever you're calling your, your, your style sheet right here. Otherwise, you're going to end up with styles in different places. And, you know, it won't break anything again, but it just becomes a little more confusing for you because you'll have different places you'll have to look for your styles. All right, we'll say OK. And again, we'll give this a background. In this case, we'll make it some version of green. <sighs> we will... Um, Give it the same width as the other one. And we'll give it this a little less of a height because we only need to have a little text in there. Um, and again, I'm going to set the padding and margin to zero. And now I'm actually going to show you what that does. OK. There's our green box. Notice there are, they all get this um, basic default content in there where it says content for class subheader section goes here. This is where I'm going to drop my in my case, images, but I could, I could just change that type because this is where I'm going to put my um, step one mix, and you know what? Let's just do all caps here for this one for fun. This will actually be a graphic from Photoshop that's going to go here, but I just wanted to show you. I've actually changed the HTML just a little bit. Um, and more importantly, let's go back to our CS Designer and show you the difference between what margin is and what um, padding is, because those are two very important objects that go with the box model. So this now we have two selectors here. That's our subheader. Uh, notice our margin says zero. Um, let's just go ahead and change. I'm going to unlock this, and then we're going to change the left margin for fun. Notice that there's this gray box that represents our actual um, subheader, our section. And if I change this, that box, let's change it to like 100. Moves 100 pixels away from that left edge. That's the 100 pixel margin. If I wanted to move it away from the top, I just change the top margin. All right, I'm going to put this back at zero. And you know what? I'm going to put this back at zero pixels too. So that's the margin. So what's the padding? Well, the padding. Notice how they they wrote these little um, these little values. This one is outside this box. It's showing you that the margins on the outer part of the box, whereas the padding. Notice they put those within the box. See that light gray box? That's the actual box, and it's trying to show you that if you change the padding. So this time, let's change the padding on the left and the top. Notice that step one mix moves off that edge. That's what the padding is. And I'm doing it for all the, you know what, instead of doing it for all of them, let's put this back to zero. I forgot to uncheck that. Let's uncheck this uh, lock box and then just dial this up so it moves away from the left edge. All right, the whole box isn't moving, just the contents within the box are moving with the padding. Now, one thing you need to know about the padding is it actually changes the size of your box that's not going to be reflected in the top. It's going to say still 80 pixels tall. The height is 80 pixels, but if I change some padding at the top, effectively, if I put 20 pixels of padding in here, my box is now 20 pixels plus 80 
which is 100 pixels tall. If I was to measure this right now, do a screen grab and drop this in Photoshop, it would be 100 pixels tall. So that's very important to note if you add padding to something, you're effectively increasing the width or height of it based on what you do. So in this case, 20 plus 80 is 100 pixels tall. All right, and it looks better. You don't want your anything sort of, I'm gonna do this one 20 pixels too. Um, so if I do want the whole thing to really be 80 pixels, I can change this to 60. So it would be 60 plus 80. That would make it 80 pixels tall. Or 60 plus 20, I'm sorry. 60 plus 20 would make it 80 pixels tall. And obviously the type looks much better, not butted up to the edge like it was before. All right, let's go back down here and add another thing. We're gonna insert some navigation. So at this point, <clears throat> you're probably getting a handle of how this works. We go to insert menu, we make sure our cursor's on the next line. This will be navigation. We're doing that red box with the uh, links on the left side. Um, we are going to make this one. Um, it's gonna be on every page, but it's gonna be a unique thing. Um, and again, it won't matter in this case which one we pick and we can change them later if we want to. I'll just go ahead and make a class and we'll call it um, um, step buttons. Do new CSS rule, um, say okay. It's on sourdough, project.css. Say okay, give it a background, make it red, because we're gonna have this on all the pages, some version of a red. And the size I'm sort of guessing at right now, I would really go back to my Photoshop document and look at um, the width and the height that I've made everything. <laughs> um, but probably about 200 pixels wide and 300 pixels tall. And you know, now that I know that if I put padding around stuff, it'll add those numbers in. Maybe let's just, just because I know I'm gonna probably, well, no, I'll leave it at zero. Well, we can always change it later if we change it. So, okay, okay. And that comes in next. Okay, the next thing is gonna be a little trickier because, well, you'll see, we hit a return and this will be our main content. If we go back to Photoshop, we've got to do the main content now. Um, you are also probably thinking, well, I also need to move that down. Well, I can add some margin there um, if I want to and that would move that box down. We'll do that really quickly. CSS designer, we need the top margin. Unlock this, scroll that up. Let's just say 35 pixels for now. Okay. Um, eventually, I'm gonna fix this, put this in fixed positioning so it will actually take it out of the normal stacking order. But we'll talk about more that more in the next demonstration. We're gonna modify this pretty heavily after we get the basic stuff laid out. Okay, we need the main content. So line 13, <clears throat> insert menu, we'll call this main. Um, we'll give this, um, we're going to ID all the main contents because I'm going to want to link to them. I might put these all on the same page um, and have everything, when you click on something, the page will auto scroll up to that spot with smooth scrolling. Um, you're welcome to do that for this project or you're welcome to make each page individually. That's really about the same amount of work. There's really no difference at all um, in terms of what's better or worse. It really depends on what model you want to use. But if we do want to be able to link to a certain section, it needs to be ID'd. So we'll call this like step zero um maybe that says stop zero. Step. I could call it step one, but it's not really step one, it's the index page. And what I want there is not to start with step one, but to give an overview of what's gonna happen. That would make more sense. So, or I could call it main zero, that would probably make more sense. Sourdough main zero. Okay. 
from now on, I'll call sourdough main one, sourdough main two, just to keep everything consistent. Um, so it's an ID selector. It's got a hashtag or a pound sign. It's going to go on our sourdough project.css style sheet, which now has several different um, rules on it. We'll say OK. This one will, again, background. I'll do a version of green, because it's going to be something that's going to change for me. But really, you can pick any color you want. These are all going to go away. It's not going to look near this ugly. <laughs> it's going to look super pretty. There might not be any background colors at all in the end. After I have content in these boxes, then I can take the background color off. Probably about 500 pixels by, I'm just going to make it um, 600 pixels tall, not 6,000. Notice in the units, there are percentages that we can use later on. We're going to be using the percentages a lot, very heavily, once we start talking about um, designing for screen size so that it's um, um, it can be flexible with the screen. Um, but that'll come later. That's kind of hard. Okay, padding. I'm going to stick zero and zero again for now and then say okay. Now watch what happens here. Like, there's the box. I'm going to put this in live view for a minute, and this is probably the time we save this and preview it. All right, it's down there. Again, why is that? Because of normal stacking order. That's how it is on my style or on my HTML, and that's how it's going to be without a style applied to it and different properties. So let me show you again. Let's go ahead and preview this in my browser with this little guy down here. Say preview, Google Chrome, save everything, save the style sheet. And then Chrome will open and show us our layout so far. OK, so we need to move this up here. Now, what do we do to use to how do we make that happen? Well, there's a property called float. Um, and if we look at my terms again, you'll see that um, this float property is described under stacking order, uses a CSS element, <coughs> um, and this float property removes the thing from the normal stacking order. So what does that mean? How's, what does it mean to remove it? Well, it basically makes, um, well, let's just go ahead and try it. It'll be easier to show you than to explain it. So if I want to um, move this object up to here, I'm going to have to float actually the thing before it. Um, the way floats were originally designed is they wanted you to be able to move text up next to a picture. So you might have a picture of a puppy and you might want to talk about the puppy. And you want the text here instead of under it. So you float this red picture or whatever is in this red box. So let's go to our CSS designer and go ahead and do that. So that was my step buttons box. You can see it's highlighted when I click it here. It highlights the box and it puts the step button button step button thing here, um, which is also where I could add an additional class or ID. You can have actually more, you can have separate classes applied to something. Like one class could make the box red and one could um, format the type a certain way because you might need different classes for different things. Um, so you can add more than, than one class. But let's go ahead and apply a float. So if we scroll down, remember we can leaf through the different objects, the different, like here's just the type things. This one just shows the set. There's no type things in my set, and so that one disappeared. Let me take that off for a minute. Um, this is everything. This first one is, but all the layout things are on top. And right under these three main boxes for, for position and margins and padding, there's this thing called float. So again, remember I'm on this red box right here. I'm going to float this left. And look what happened. For some weird reason, although it's not weird, it's, I can explain it here in a minute. This next main section, my SD main zero, went up behind it. Well, like I said, when you float something, it takes it out of the normal stacking order. And so what that means is that this it's invisible to the next object. So let's go put, put this in split again. So <clears throat> line 12 is that red box, which we just floated. And so basically line 13, which is our main thing, thinks the next it's coming after this line, line 11, because this now being floated has taken it out of the stacking order. It's made it invisible to anything under it. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not going to help me. I want that green box to move over. 
And you might think, oh, I'll just add some margin. And that would be actually, that would work fine. But the other thing is that we have to realize is that when, when multiple objects are floated, they have their own stacking order together as floating objects. So if I was to float this main ID one, this green box here, then it would recognize that it's part of the stacking order with this other floated box and it would actually take the spot over here. Watch how that works. So we'll go to main and float that one as well. I'm going to float it left. Notice how it pops over. And I am going to add some margin here for now, but later we're going to, I'm going to show you um, in the next exercise how we can have that center for all different browsers. Oops, again, I did that. I've got to uncheck that. Um, all right, we will put a little on the top as well. All right, we did 35 for the other one, so we'll do 35 pixels for this too, and just make that an even 100 pixels. All right, cool. Let's preview it one more time before we put the last box in. <clears throat> okay. You probably noticed also in my layouts, I had the main content here with the description under that. We are going to add two boxes with inside this box. So we're going to have a parent and two children. But we're going to save the, the parent-child thing till next time. We're going to, it's called, also called nesting. We're going to nest two boxes in here, two child boxes. And the beauty of that is whenever, whatever I do with this box, the things inside of it will move with it. So it's less worrying about positioning and things like that. Really, all we need is one more box right here. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's pop back over here and put our cursor in the right spot again. Now it's line 14. Cert. We'll call this another navigation because it's going to be links. Um, I'll call this one. I'll give it a clap. Oops, I don't need to put the period. I'll put that there later. I tend to do that which is not good because then I'll put double periods and I don't want that, but I'll notice it, don't worry. Um, but we'll call this one, um, we'll call the other one step buttons. We'll call this one um, external, that's for EX for external link. Buttons. They won't really be buttons, but they'll be links. Okay, new CSS rule, Sourdough project, dot external link buttons or period because it's a class say okay background some version of red box we want it to be the same size as the other one so 300 by 200 no it was opposite it was 300 tall and 200 wide and zero zero Oh, and I should have just went ahead and floated it, right? Because look where it showed up. Again, it's behind these two things that are both floated. Because again, it, re it recognizes my green bar here, my subheader, as the next, it's, it thinks it's under that because these two lines have been floated via CSS. You know, these two elements have been floated. So again, they're taken out of the normal stacking order. So this, external link buttons goes up over here. So we should just go ahead and float that too, right? And you might have noticed in our CSS designer <coughs> that, and to make this a wee bit bigger, that I also had a float right button. So I can do that. I'm gonna go ahead back to my margin and add 30 pixels on the top of that. So everything looks kind of normal. Now here in this screen, everything looks you know fairly centered. There's a little bit more room over here, but I'm not gonna start messing with the margin on this because here's what happens with new designers is they get really obsessed with their um, the thing they're looking at, which makes sense because you know you're used to looking at very specific things um, with very specific sizes like book covers or poster or whatever. But in this case, if I go ahead and preview it over here. Depending on my browser size, you know, okay, it's centered here, 
but now it's not. Right? Those things aren't moving. That's what we're going to do next class period. Okay, so next, next, or next demo. <laughs> the next demo, we're going to have this automatically center in whatever size thing we want, and this will make this look better. We're going to set these things to 100% so they automatically fill. And then what we'll do with the content with inside of them is center the content within these boxes. All right, so I'll have some graphics. We're going to need to start putting some graphics in for some of this. Um, so like you guys, I'll be working on developing my sourdough graphics in Photoshop and creating my mock-up in Photoshop. Um, so I'll move from the wireframe to a mock-up, which will be the actual graphics for my, my home screen, my index page. Okay, so um, let me leave you with this uh, list of um, items that we talked about today. It's really just an overview. Please feel free to rewind and replay any of this uh, video that you might need to um, need to review. And I should one last time show you my our, my CSS. Put it in code view so you can see all this. So there's all of our our rules. We've created um, one, two, three, four, five selectors because there's five boxes. Um, and you know we haven't even put any type or anything in them yet and formatted that. We'll need different selectors for the type, um, depending. Um, we could, just to show you, like the step one mix <coughs> was in the subheader. I could go to this type thing and I could say, oh, you know what, I want my text alignment, you know, I want my color of my text to be um, white. And now my text is white. So I haven't added a lot of these properties. And again, the beauty of Dreamweaver is that it lets you see all the properties that are available to you. So if you've taken another class in web design, you've, you've hand-coded everything, um, I'm glad you know that, but I would totally recommend that you get used to this CSS designer window because it will save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration because um, sometimes you'll have errors. Like I have an error here, I <laughs> put, that's not right. All this is color-coded. <laughs> Um, so that if there's an error, I can see it. I put a, instead of zero pixels, I must put O pixels somehow. Duh. Um, but notice how it's all nicely color coded, so that's super handy. And even when you hand type it, it's, it's color coded. But more importantly, this <coughs> window over here lets you see all your options. If you scroll down through here, you get a good sense of what everything you can do with type. Don't need to remember how you're supposed to type the property because that's a lot to remember. All the different um, things you can do with the border, how you can do a corner radius, how you can do backgrounds, how you can do all that stuff is all listed right in there and it covers all the basics. So um, I do hand edit sometimes, but if I need to change a value, but for the most part, all my properties, and I would recommend this for you to use this window here to set your properties. All right, so that was the last look at our CSS style sheet. There again, five styles on it. Notice how they're all formatted the same with the curly braces. The only thing that's different is some of them are IDs, some of them are classes. Classes of a period, the IDs have um, a hashtag, and there's a few more different ways of, there's a few more selectors we haven't talked about yet. Um, including an HTML, HTML element selector, which is super powerful, uh, and a pseudo class selector that'll come up soon enough too. Okay, that is definitely all for today.